This is the Family Computer, or Famicom for short, released by Nintendo in Japan in 1983. If we take a look at the packaging here, photo of the product on a silver background, very simple. Same goes for the long side, the logo, and a photo of the Famicom next to the lineup of launch titles. Short side, just the logo and copyright 1983 Nintendo Company Limited. Same designs repeat on the other two sides. And on the bottom, <laughs> you don't get any more than a big block of styrofoam, which is something that uh, Nintendo has gained a little bit of infamy for within the ecological community. I think it was as recently as the Wii years where Nintendo was ranked very high among companies that were ecologically unfriendly, due mostly in part to their use of styrofoam in their packaging. But that's changed. If you've unboxed a Wii recently, you've probably noticed everything in there is cardboard packaging. So at least they're trying to improve in that, in that aspect. So you take the top cover off. Let me see what we got here. Take a look at the paperwork. This is cool. This is a manga. It's basically an instruction booklet for kids. And then you've got the more adult technical instruction booklet. But what's cool about the manga is it goes through and in a story type of way tells the kids how to hook it up, how to play it. And what I think is really cool is it tells you what not to do. Don't drop it. Don't get it wet. It even says, hey kids, here's what it looks like inside. We took it apart for you. Look, you don't need to. So this manga is kind of more for the kids. Very technical, even for kids, but I think it's interesting. So um, I will, if I've got time at the end of this video, I'll post scans so you can take a look at it and pause it to see the detail. The real instruction manual isn't quite as interesting. Basically just diagrams and schematics and instructions, all in Japanese, of course. What is interesting about the Japanese manuals for the early Nintendo systems is on the back they had a sticker that has the serial number for the system and the system itself has that same sticker affixed to the bottom. So for collectors you want to be sure that if you're getting an instruction manual with your system that the uh, serial numbers match. The only other items are paperwork, of paperwork are some warnings. Some about the AC adapter and then some other things that I'm not sure what they mean. What's in the box? What do we have here? Just the AC adapter um, to plug into the wall to provide power to the system. And the RF switch. This is an old way of hooking up electronics to a TV. RF stands for radio frequency. And what it does is it transmits over a particular TV channel. In Japan, I believe it's channels one and two. So you set your TV to channel one or two, set this to game, turn it on, and it will broadcast over whatever is being shown on TV on that channel. The only problem with RF is it doesn't provide the best picture quality, especially uh, compared to what we have with uh, component video, composite video, and HDMI, of course. This little adapter here is for the RF switch. Different TVs had different ways to hook things up, so in case your TV required this, Nintendo provided it for you. No game was included with this system. Uh, there were several different varieties of pack-in games for the uh, American Nintendo Entertainment System, but looking online and reading through um, explanations and things about the Famicom, I have never heard of a game packaged with it. But if you know differently, please feel free to let me know in the comments. So that leaves us the most important thing in the box, which is the Famicom itself. I'll take it out here. Kind of a red and white color scheme going on here. Very small, especially compared to the uh, U.S. Nintendo Entertainment System. We'll take a look at the uh, controls on top. Got a vent in the back. A flap that you had to flip up and flip down yourself to put in the cartridge here. Power switch. No LED light. Just an orange sticker to let you know that it's on. A reset button. 
and an eject button. More of a lever here in this case. Let's take a look at a game. I have Devil World here. You've seen me unbox this before. Famicom games were fairly simple in their packaging. Just a cardboard box, plastic tray, instruction manual, and then the game in a bag. So games were inserted like so. And then you turn the power on. And when you're finished, turn the power off, slid the eject button forward, and the game would pop out to be removed easily. It's not necessary, but it's a lot harder to get the game out if you don't eject it first. Moving along to the front, you'll see a port here with a plastic cover. This was for peripherals such as the zapper gun. And the reason that it, they needed a separate port is the two standard controllers were hardwired to the system. Turn it around to the controllers here. You'll see on the back, they're hardwired directly into the system. You can't unhook them at all unless you open it up. We're taking a look at the controllers. You had one for player one and player two. Very clearly labeled one. Very similar to the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System controller with just some different design cues. Got the D-pad. Start and select buttons, A, B buttons, and some interesting just blank space up here. Looks a little unfinished in my opinion, but that's the way it was. Interesting collector's note is I believe that the very first editions of the Famicom had square-shaped A and B buttons. And they may have even been more rubberized like the select and start buttons. But these are the more modern round hard plastic A and B buttons. Something else that's different between the uh, Famicom and the US uh, Nintendo Entertainment System controllers is the shape. Those of us who get nostalgic about the Nintendo Entertainment System controllers always reminisce about how the sharp corners dug into your hands after a long time of gaming. Not the case with these. Very round. And throughout the entire controller there's this lip that helps it seat firmly here into the body of the system can't pull it forward, can only pull it up. On the other side, there's a controller for player two, clearly labeled. Quite a bit different than the uh, controller for player one. No start and select buttons. It does have the D-pad though and the A and B buttons. And additionally, it has a volume control and a microphone. And that was used in some games such as The Legend of Zelda. And some modifications had to be made for the US version because no microphone was present on any of the controllers for the uh, Nintendo Entertainment System. Flip it around to the back here. Got your input for the power, AC adapter. If you're going to watch TV, you got to switch this back to TV so it knows to take what's being broadcast on TV over the game signal. Channel 1 or Channel 2. In Japan, if you're going to use RF to hook anything up to your TV, you have a choice between channel 1 and channel 2. Some TVs gave you a better signal on channel 1, others on channel 2. They gave you a choice between those. In the United States, it's channels 3 and 4. And if you're going to use a Japanese system on an American TV, it's channel 95 or channel 96. And then to be able to do all that, Here's your input, I'm sorry, your output for the RF goes to the TV and broadcast over channels 1 or 2 in Japan or 95, 96 in the United States. And the only other thing of interest to the system is the bottom. Isn't really too much interesting here other than there's the serial number sticker which matches the one on the instruction manual. And a bit of a collector's note, like those square buttons, A, B buttons on the original release of the Famicom, this or uh, gosh, it's kind of a maroonish red plastic. On the very first Famicoms, it was smooth. This is a newer one, so it's got a little bit more of a texture to it. So if you're collecting, that may be something you want to look for. So that's the Famicom, released in 1983. And I've read that Nintendo has a policy of supporting its products, or at least the Famicom, for 20 years. 
And I believe this was in production, not just supported, until 2003. Very recently. It was phenomenally popular in Japan, as was the Super Famicom. They tend to have a lot longer shelf life than uh, they do in the United States. So, speaking of the United States, that brings me to the American Nintendo Entertainment System. And here it is, the North American Nintendo Entertainment System. This was one of several hardware and software configurations released in the United States. And this was the very same one that I received from my 8th birthday in 1987. This is the exact same box, exact same packaging. However, given that I was only 8 years old and I didn't treat things quite as well as I do now, the actual Nintendo Entertainment System and the game and the controllers have all been replaced. But everything else is my original from my birthday that year. So as far as I know, and please correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Famicom was only re uh, released in Japan by itself without any pack-in games. But in the United States, the Nintendo Entertainment System was released in several configurations. This isn't the original. The original was something called the Deluxe Set that had uh, the Nintendo Entertainment System, two controllers, the Zapper, the Robot, Gyromite game, Duck Hunt game. This one is a little bit more simple, and I think it retailed for about $80. So if we take a look at the box here, similar design as the front. On the back, you get a full box here. Photo of a happy family playing Super Mario Brothers. Screenshot of Super Mario Brothers, and then just some details about the system. So there were several reasons why the Nintendo Entertainment System had such a, an overhaul and a name change and just a different aesthetic than the Japanese Famicom. And a lot of those reasons were for marketing, some of them were for cultural reasons, etc. I'm going to get into some of those. So the one that is most obvious is that this is huge in comparison to the Famicom. And I guess the American mentality is that bigger is better. You see it in cars, we want to feel like we're getting more for our money, so it's bigger. We open it up. And you thought the Famicom was bad with styrofoam. Well, this sucker is encased in styrofoam. Certainly well protected, but I hate to think that millions of these are sitting in landfills now. Take the top off here, and we're confronted by Rob the Robot. This is one of the first changes, or first reasons, why the Nintendo Entertainment System was different than the Famicom. In the United States in 1983, something called the video game crash occurred. Atari had flooded the market with poor video games. Video games weren't selling and retailers no longer wanted to stock video game products. Nintendo's Famicom was doing phenomenally well in uh, Japan, but they couldn't get it into the United States due to the stigma that video games carried. So, Nintendo of America received instructions to totally revamp the aesthetic, the name, the design of the Famicom, and what we got was the Nintendo Entertainment System. The first uh, change was the name. They wanted to get rid of any ties to video games. Nintendo Entertainment System. Well, nobody knew what Nintendo was at the time. That was just the company name. Entertainment System. Well, something for fun, but not video games. Instead, they wanted you to think it was some sort of configuration with a gun, the zapper, with Rob the, Robot, Rob the Robot, it was a toy. It wasn't necessarily a video game. And that ploy actually worked. It got it into stores and began to sell. And once Super Mario Brothers came out, it was all over. So that's why they wanted you to see Rob up front and center in the paperwork that's included here. So let's take a look at some of this paperwork here. What have we? got subscription for the Nintendo Fun Club newsletter that would later become uh, Nintendo Power Magazine. A little insert blurb about what the Nintendo seal of quality was supposed to mean back then. The instruction manual for the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the control deck as they dubbed it. Unfortunately, no manga with the US release. Then a huge poster with Rob the Robot and several of the original launch black box games. I'm not going to unfold this poster here because it's huge. 
if you do want to see it, it's in some of my other videos. I have it framed and centered over my video game shelves. So let's take a look and see what we got in the box here. Copy of Super Mario Brothers in box. And this is my original from when I was a kid. So there's tape on the top, tape on the bottom. The hang tab is ripped out. I love it. AC adapter for power. RF switch for AV hookup, just like the Japanese Famicom. A little bit different of a design though, smaller. You also get those adapters for the RF switch, just in case uh, your TV has different hookups. They were kind enough to include those for you. AV cables. This is the first uh, design and technical difference we're going to see uh, with the NES versus the Famicom. You could hook it up using the RF switch, broadcasting over channels 3 or 4, like I explained earlier. Or you could hook it up with composite video and mono sound, which would give you quite a bit better uh, sound and video quality. And I'll show you those hookups once we take a look at the system. And the other thing of note here, of interest, the controller. Generally similar in design to the Famicom controller. Got your D-pad, select and start buttons, A and B buttons, and it looks like they found something to fill that blank space with from the Famicom controller, the Nintendo logo. Ah, and there are those sharp corners that dig into your hands after hours of gameplay. Something that's very different about these controllers is they're not hardwired. They're removable from the system with these plugs and the cord is much longer. That's one of the first cultural differences between the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Famicom. From what I understand, uh, housing space is limited in, in Japan, so the Famicom was to sit right next to you on the ground. It had a long RF switch cord, so that would sit next to you, and then the very short uh, controller cords were not a problem. In bigger houses in the United States, our video game system stayed on entertainment centers and we sat back on the couch, which necessitated a longer cord. So, detachable controllers and long cords, some of the first differences. We take a look at the actual system. We'll see some more. I already explained that uh, they had received instructions to rename the system without any allusion to it being a video game system. So hence we got Nintendo Entertainment System. It's very much bigger than the, um, the Famicom. And that was another instruction that they received. They wanted it to be bigger. They wanted it to look like a VCR, something that looked more technical like uh, some sort of electric apparatus that would sit next to your TV. They didn't want it to look like a toy because toys were associated with video game systems. They wanted it to look like some high-tech type of thing that was meant for kids, but it was still technology, trying to appeal to both markets. They were also told to make it look like a VCR, which is why it has this door here. The door flips up to put the cartridge in. And the cartridges are quite a bit different than the Famicom cartridges. Famicom cartridge, you'd lose it in there. Nintendo Entertainment System cartridges, quite a bit bigger. Let's take a look. This is a Nintendo Entertainment System game, Rad Racer. Open it up here. This one's unique in that it came with 3D glasses because it had a 3D mode, which in pretty much everybody's opinion didn't really work. But anyway, here's the Super NES game. I'm sorry, not Super NES game, NES game. Compare it to a Famicom game. You take a look that even the cartridge board is smaller in the Famicom. So these are not compatible in any way. A common complaint against Atari was how hard that their games were to remove. So to kind of kill two birds with one stone, making this look like high-tech equipment, a VCR, you got the, the front load. To eliminate how hard it was to take out Atari games, Nintendo developed this system where you just push in the game, 
and push it down and close your lid, which as kids we never did. Open the lid, push down, pull out, very easy if it's sitting on the ground. Also on the front we got the power and reset buttons with a red LED light to show that it's on. Two controller ports. Around this side here we have our AV out. This is the best way to get the best picture quality out of the Nintendo Entertainment System using the supplied audio video cables. And on the back, just like the Famicom, got your AC power in. Selector between channel 3 or channel 4, depending on which channel you got the better picture, and then the RF output to the TV. Nothing on this side really. Top was flat with some vents, which would become very problematic, and I'll explain that when we talk about the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And then on the bottom, kind of an interesting design. Got some cutouts here. Kind of makes you think that uh, this was meant to sit on top of something, an add-on or peripheral. In Japan, the Famicom got a disk system and a modem, and all those things interfaced with the cartridge slot. Well, obviously those same things couldn't interface with this cartridge slot because it was so far in the system. So instead, what Nintendo did was they put a port on the bottom, remove this plastic cover, you pry up, and I mean break off this plastic piece, it'll reveal some sort of serial port that was probably intended to be connected with um, a peripheral such as a modem or maybe even a disk system. But the Nintendo Entertainment System was so popular on its own that nothing like that was ever released in the United States. So, those are some of the differences between the Nintendo Entertainment System in the United States and the Famicom in Japan. And not everything lasts forever. All good things come to an end, as was the case with the Nintendo Entertainment System, but it was succeeded by the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in the United States and the Super Famicom in Japan, which is what we're going to take a look at next.